Ruiz. Welcome back to the next part of this Truth and Rhythm episode. Be sure to subscribe to this channel. If you've already done so, please share it with friends. Also become a member by joining Truth and Rhythm on Patreon or consider donating at funkinstuff.net. Thank you so much for your interest and support. Enjoy. You mentioned uh, Roxy Music that you were with them when Juicy hit. Um, yes. But what was the first um, artist outside of like funk R&B that kind of took you, you know, into other territories? My first gig outside, what, look, what a charmed life. Okay, I'm in the M2MA band, right? Never sang in a band before. My first gig outside of the country was with Brian Ferry and Roxy Music. <laughs> and it's like, and it was so... It, it was so amazing when we uh, we got to our hotel rooms. I thought that they had given me the the, the stars room because the room was bigger than the apartment that I was living in. I wasn't accustomed to the grandeur of 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 uh, a big pop group. You know that it was amazing. So Roxy Music was my first time out of the country, and the, my first major tour. Go figure. My first time was like one of the biggest tours ever, the Avalon tour with King Crimson and Adrian Ballou and Brian Ferry and Roxy Music it was amazing. But how did you make that connection though after your history on funk and R&B? Because you know, it's a little bit of like different worlds. Uh, it is two you know. different worlds, but you know what? Um, as a contractor, I hired singers and <clears throat> some singers um, like um, I, the, the first time I worked with Luther, I hired him to do a session. And, uh, and uh, we got along so well until he said, you know, when I have some gigs coming up, I'm gonna call you. I sang on Luther's um, demo for Never Too Much, his first album. And, um, and he, kept some, he kept the demo vocals um, to, uh, you know, for the final, the final, uh, the final mixes, he kept the demo vocals. And so that's how I met Luther. And then I met Fonzie, his friend Fonzie and Fonzie and I have sung, I've sung with Fonzie more than anybody else on earth. I mean, it's like, every time I look up, I'm standing next to Fonzie. And so he had a gig with Brian Ferry. He said, Brian's looking for a couple of girls to take out on the road. Would you like to go? I was like, sure. But I didn't know I was going to be like in Europe, touring in Europe for like three or four months. But, you know, but I'd never been anywhere. So it was like, it's exciting. I keep keep, keep the bag packed because you never know where you're going to be going. So um, that, that's how I got uh, hooked up with Brian Ferry from with my friend Fonzie Thornton, who I've worked with a million times. I mean, on Letterman, on, um, on the TV shows on uh, award shows, I always look up and, and I always say, Fonzie, here we go again. Either at the Kennedy Center Honors or Songwriters Hall of Fame or things like, I mean, you know, it was, it was, it was like magic. I don't know how these things happen. Everything was by word of mouth. I never had a manager. I never had a manager. So it's like, how'd you get work? Well, people like, they heard what I did. They liked what I did. And they wanted the girl who sang on what they liked. And so and that was my whole career, just yeah. like that. Never Roxy, had a business card, not once. Roxy Music, uh, I know Love is a Drug, of course, by them. I yes. don't know a lot of their catalog, but uh, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, was it uh, challenging to like learn the whole repertoire? And Well, you know, back then I was, I was really young. So <laughs> my brain was like a sponge. <laughs> I could learn just about anything. It was, it was no problem. I, and I was excited about, about being outside of the country because I'd never traveled before. And I got a chance to see the world on a whole nother level. 
with them. So, but, and, and they were really nice people and very talented and, and, um, and, and they were very welcoming. And so it was, it was, it was an easy, easy job. It was easy. Cause I mean, I loved what I did and I liked the music. There's nothing worse than doing a tour with music that you hate. <laughs> That's the worst thing. That's the worst thing ever. So, but I'm with Roxy. It's like, I loved it. I love them. They exposed me to an, another part of the world. And Tume opened up one part and they, they opened up another, which led me to other people, which led me to Lenny Kravitz, which led me to David Bowie, which led, yeah, and it was like, wow, what a life. <laughs> Thank you, God. <laughs> in, in looking at your history of credits, um, I did see in 81, Jay Giles band. Is that a oh my God, I, freeze frame. Yeah, freeze I mean, frame. that was like one of the biggest hits of that year. You know? Yes, it was. And that was Luther Vandross, Sissy Houston, and myself on Freeze Frame. <laughs> it's like, whoa. And then one, one day, I, was, I used to do Letterman, Dave, the David Letterman show. Uh, Paul Schaefer had called me for a gig. And the, the, the guy from Jay Giles' band was there. And it's like, oh, my God, don't I know you? He said, yeah, I'm from Jay Giles' band. You sang on the record. It's like, ah, you know. And that's how I also by doing Letterman show, um, f f again, once again, Fonty Thornton and myself, we were hired to sing and we found out that it was for Brian Ferry. Again, this is like 10 or 15 years later. And he said, oh, Fonzie Tawatha, uh, how you doing? Would you like to go out on tour? I'm doing like Europe and doing the States. And it's like, sure. And that's how we got the gig to, mm. do, to do his summer US tour and his summer tour in Europe. So. It's all word of mouth. It's all being in the right place at the right time. Yeah, it's a charmed life, but you know, it's only because you deliver like you deliver too. Well, but you know, well, now you got to keep your end up now. You can't, they're not going to, you know, they're not going to call on you if you don't do your job, you know, because well, then the wrong word gets out. It's like, you know, because I'm very dependable. I, I, I'm always prepared and whoever I bring with me will always be prepared. So like when I work with Dave Matthews, it's like, uh, come and do we did a re recording session one song and um it was called stay and they were performing at the meadowlands which is in new jersey a big stadium in new jersey and they they said well will you girls it was brenda white king cindy mizell and myself will you girls come and sing this song for us I, it's like sure they got us a bus it's like it's just three of us. <laughs> we we had a bus to ourselves, and I said, you know, Dave, we can sing on more than one song. We can do a couple of more songs, and that turned into two years worth of work, you know. And then fifteen years later, he calls me back. He says, can you get? We want to bring the lovely ladies back. We, they call us the lovely ladies. Can you? We want to bring the lovely ladies back. Can you get a couple more girls and come out with us again? And that was two more two more tours. So. It's all about keeping those good relationships, you know, because if I couldn't do it myself, I could find somebody that could do it, you know, but I, you know, that was Dave. I had to do it myself, <laughs> you know, so it was, it was, it's always, you, you always have to leave like you're going to come back, you know, if, if the, if when the tour is don't over, burn bridges. you know, yeah. yeah, no, no, we don't burn bridges, no. no but no. you also have to be versatile, you know, I mean, your career shows your versatility as well. Sure, sure. I mean, between look, Dave Matthews bands, the the brothers Vaughn, the family style, Stevie Ray Vaughn and his brother. I mean, um, uh, Jay Giles band. Um, what's the guy from the from the Cars? Um, oh my God, Rick, Rick Ocasek. Rick Ocasek. I mean, what Nile Nile Rogers produced that. Nile used to call me for a lot of work, and um, so it, it, I just ran the gamut. I mean, it was just all genres, all genres, all genres. You know? Yeah. Did you so, uh, uh, do anything differently depending on what the genre was? You know, if it was like, you know, pop versus rock versus funk, R&B. Well, um, they fine tuned it once we got there to rehearsal because, you know, it was like if you're doing the country, country, uh, a country thing, it's, it's different. It, even though it might sound similar, it's different from R&B. So, you know, you, you have to take instructions. You have to be able to take constructive criticism and going out there and get the job done. And then, and then you just, you keep, and you keep working. So everybody had a little thing that they want, they needed in w whatever song they were doing. It's like, okay, fine. Just, just let me know what it is. 
and then and we'll work on it and and we delivered because I mean, you got that r b power you know so did they ever tell you to pull it back a little bit oh let me oh my god in every session to walk or stand behind the baffle <laughs> i mean i had a big voice um so and and i was always the shortest one in the in the group and this would be groups with like um with uh, uh, my mentor gwen guthrie um and all these people are very tall and so I had to stand on a guitar case just so I could be level with the other singers, you know, because I'm so short, but I was short, but I was loud. And so I would have, sometimes I would have to stand behind the group to sing, depending on what it, what the song was. Cause I know when we did Love Power for Luther, it was a big group of people. I mean, it might've been maybe 10 or 15 people. And, um, but he had all the powerhouses in there. So it was like, everybody had to stand back from the mic. You know, I was there with Darlene Love and, and Lisa Fisher and Cindy and Fonzie and um, just, ugh, it was a wonderful, wonderful time. But yes, because I have a powerful voice, I sometimes I have to stand behind the people. But I also know how to be do it quietly, you know. But sometimes it's, it's, it's hard to... Uh, it's hard to, uh, if they're asking for a certain thing, it's like either you have to belt it out or you have to be quiet. So then you have to learn how to work the microphone. So, you know, just another aspect of the job. You got to work the mic. Yeah, you got to work your instrument. Mm -hmm. um, this is going to be put you on the spot a little bit, but I'm going to just throw it out there. You know, of all the great female vocalists that you've crossed paths with or worked with, you know, from Aretha to mm -hmm. um, Celine to um, Whitney, uh, et cetera. Who like really do you think just could blow the oh. best? Oh, Aretha, Aretha. No, hands, hands down, hands down, hands down. Aretha, I would work with, I work with Aretha. Um, we did a song called Jump To It that Luther produced. And um, she liked it so much. She wanted the singers that sang on the record to go out on tour with her. That's how I started working with Aretha. And I worked with her for 10 years. Um, and I, I even did her last performance. Um, but she, she could sing anything. She could play anything. She didn't even need, she didn't need to have a band. All, all, she, all you had to have was an evening with Aretha at the piano. She was that talented. And, and uh, I, when I was in college, when I was at Howard, I had a poster of Aretha on my wall. And it's like, one day I'm gonna sing with this lady. And, and it happened, and it happened. Just like, and she would, she would be, we would be in a show and she had the singers in the bow of the piano. And sometimes she would sing and I would just, she would bring tears to my eyes. I would just cry because she's, she was like, oh my God, this is, this is, this is what heaven must be like hearing Aretha sing all the time. You know, it was amazing. Mm. It was amazing. She yeah. is that, she is the queen. I mean, really the queen of soul. That was really yeah. And all those other women are great. The Celine's and the Whit Whitney's are amazing. And uh, I mean, I like Jasmine Sullivan. I like Faith Evans. Um, I like Lauren Hill. Um, but it was something about Aretha that just, she could just play anything and sing anything, anything. Also, didn't it's such an amazing voice, but it also seems so effortless. Yes, and that's why every I think that's why everybody loved her. It's like I want to sing like that. You know, we'd be, be listening to an Aretha record or something, and then play it over and over to try to get the riffs, try to get Aretha's riffs. You know, how did she do that? Oh my gosh! Mm. And it was, and and I actually saw her doing that. I mean, it's like, oh, well, I did that in 1960 something. I'm not, I don't have to sing it like that anymore. You know, but Aretha was the the queen, the queen of soul, for <laughs> real. <laughs> <laughs> did, did you ever cross paths with Shaka? You know, yes. Um, I never, oh, Sh uh, Shaka Khan was on the David Letterman show and we were singing. I was in the, in the group that was singing with, with Shaka. And um, I know, of course, I know some people in her, in her 
in her her background. I know some of her background singers, but Shaka is amazing. Oh, when uh, and Tume did their first show in Europe, we opened for Shaka Khan. And so I got a chance to meet her then. And of course, my friends were singing background for her. So it's like, oh, it was like old home week. But Shaka, that now that voice is so unique and just, you know, she's she's in a class all by herself. She's in a class all by herself. Yeah. Because she she could sing anything also. Yeah. <laughs> Love her. What a oh, voice. She just floors me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um you know, you've done so much work. I can't possibly get into all of it, but I did want to just maybe throw a few out at you and just get okay. your quick response on some of, on some of those. Okay. Um, let's see. I'll cherry pick. Uh, Philip Bailey. Oh, from Earth, Wind, and Fire? <laughs> I think Niles, Niles did something um, uh, with him and we sang on it. But the voice, I mean, his the, the, the falsetto was amazing. The falsetto was amazing. The Philadelphia. Yeah. So you worked, so viewers know you worked on Inside Out. Credit on that from 86. <laughs> 86. Oh my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. 86. <laughs> oh my goodness. Okay. So if you say so. Um, because you know, actually, um, there's this website and it's like, how many songs did Tawatha AG sing on? And it's in it's it's in the it's in the thousands. It's in the thousands. And it's like, you can't possibly remember everything. And it's like, I don't, you know, for me, it was just work. It was just work. And if I didn't write down the, the artist and the, 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 the titles of the songs that I sang on, I would, I would never remember half the stuff. Well, you luckily know? for you, I'm here to help right now. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You, uh, you worked with uh, Jeffrey Osborne, one of my favorite male vocalists. You know what? I fell in love with Jeffrey Osborne when he was with LTD. And he did love ballad in like the mid seventies, I think it was. And it's like this song. And and I think Skip Scarborough wrote that song. And um, and I wanted him to write something for me. I wanted Skip Scarborough to write something for me. And then in, in the, with Jeffrey Osborne, the duet he did with, um, um, oh my God. Joyce uh, Kennedy? J- yes. From Mother's Finest. That's like, oh, the, the Mother's Finest rock and roll band, you know, but the, but, but the, she was amazing. She was amazing. Amazing. Yes. No, Jeffrey Osborne. Yeah. And a u- unique voice, but just, mm, yeah, that's a good one. That's that was um, ni- 1990, Only Human. Uh, oh, I sang on that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Let me uh, look into your, your royalty checks. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> hopefully somebody's keeping oh, track don't of worry I, I look at them I, I you know you have to pay taxes on that stuff <laughs> so i know about those yeah i know about good, those. good good um and you mentioned the vaughn brothers did you actually meet stevie ray i met oh my god stevie ray and what was the, the brother's name jimmy um, jimmy i met jimmy because stevie was the one that that passed away in the in the um, helicopter accident. And we had just finished Family Style because Nile Rogers had produced that. We just finished that. And he he was killed in the, the, the uh, helicopter accident. And the record company made him do a, like a video. And it's like, it would, I mean, he had just, he was such a lovely man. Uh, uh, a lovely man, but he was crushed that he had to do that, and so because they wanted to profit off of his brother's death, and it's like, mm-hmm. oh my God! And it, and he said, just bear, bear with me, you know, help me out, because that was Curtis King and myself. We sang on that, and and we also we were in the video. I can't even remember the video because I, I couldn't watch it because it was like, it's, it was it was painful because the the man was crushed that he had lost his, his brother, but the album was great. <laughs> So, I mean, you know, but it was, it was, you know, sometimes it's not good. Sometimes it's not good, but no, they're great guys. Also, they had finally collaborated and then Stevie was gone. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, how do you connect with the Talking Heads people? 
to, that was with Nile. I did a lot of work with Nile. Um, mm. And also, um, I think, I believe Bernie Worrell <laughs> worked with them. Um, B- Bernie played with them. So, um, yeah, it was, that was through Nile because I did a lot of work with Nile. Yeah. Was what, was your, what was your relationship with Bernie Worrell, if at all? Um, well, you know, Bernie was, Bernie's from Jersey. I mean, we were all here. I mean, we're in the studio jamming and they, oh, hey, Bernie, how you doing? It's like, oh, he, Bernie's in town. He's because he's usually he was away working with with other artists, you know. So um, but we we were fortunate enough to have Bernie come in and play. And and when he came in, it just it just inspired people to be even funkier than they already were. Because Bernie was the best. Definitely. Bernie, Bernie was the best, you know. And he was so quiet and unassuming. But when you gave him that keyboard, it was like, oh, my God, who, who is this man? <laughs> he was amazing. Yeah. Yeah. He colored through the keyboards like nobody else. Yes, yes, yes. We called him the colorologist because he would he would add those other colors to whatever it was you were doing, you know. Whew. Mm. As a matter of fact, he played on, I believe he played on, we had a song called Ready for Your Love. And Bernie put those little haunting keyboard things on, on, on that track. It was like, well, damn, Bernie, that's really, that's so cool. <laughs> Actually, was he involved at all related to Juicy Fruit? Um, well, you know, I wasn't there when they did the tracks because I was out on tour. All I know is I had to come in and sing the vocal. So everything was already done by the time I got to do my vocal. And oh, oh one little quick story with, uh, with Juicy Fruit. Um, it was time to sing. And so M. Tume was trying, you know, being in his creative mode. So he says, I got this great idea. I want you to sing it dry. It's like, what? It's like, that's not going to work. He said, oh, no, no, let's try this. It'll be cool. It'll be cool. And it's like, M. Tume, mm-mm. okay, let's, let's, let's make a deal. Put the reverb on while I'm singing and you take it off in the mix because the track is totally dry. That's another reason why I think people like that song. The track was dry, but um, but it's like while I while I'm singing, I have to have some reverb. So just take it off in the mix, and and that's how we got through Juicy Fruit because it it was going to be a standoff because it's like I can't sing, I can't sing like that, I can't sing dry, you know, I can't sing dry. Was that the biggest creative discussion you ever had? Yeah, yeah, because you know. I'm, I'm look, look, I flew in, I flew in from, from London. It's like, I'm not, it's, I, I have to make sure that I'm happy with what I'm doing. So, um, and we discussed it and he saw it my way and, and, uh, you know, and it came and it came out fine. Yeah. Did you ever yeah, say, compromise See, I told you, something. I told you, <laughs> I told you so. <laughs> And you worked with Roberta Flack, who, you know, that's another one that seemed to come full circle after the Closer I Get to You situation, right? Roberta Flack. um, I did a show with her in, um, I don't know, I think it was Jamaica. And and she had the whole band. It was actually the M2 A band. And and she had me singing background and Gwen Guthrie and Brenda White. And so it was like, oh my God, this is like Miss Flack. Because, you know... um, she 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 left Howard before I did, so it's like this is such an honor. I mean, I mean, with the Howard, blah 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 blah, and so that that connection was there. But I never sang anything else with her. We I, I did that live performance with her, but um, never on uh, her record because she had her own she had her own group of singers. This this shows you as uh, being on set the night to music in ninety one. Set, so, oh my god. I think I remember that. Okay, that might be right. <laughs> you know, we're talking about it a long time. A yeah. long time. Yeah. Um, and you, according to this, uh, worked with Al Green? Oh, let me tell you about Reverend Al. Um, I did a lot of things with Reverend Al on the David Letterman show. And he had um, he had gotten his Kennedy Center Honors Award and he came to do Letterman the um, like the day after, and I was part of the group. And also, I sang with uh, Al Green because he was a guest for Dave Matthews, 
and um, we got a chance to sing with him on the Dave Matthews show. And so um, Reverend Al was cool. And and once he we when I uh, was working at Saturday Night Live, Al Green was supposed to you know it was like their twenty fifth anniversary. You know it's a big to do. Al is not there. It's time to go on stage, and Al is not there. He run. Everybody's in place on stage. He's running down the hallway and runs to the, up on the stage and at the mic and doesn't miss a beat. Al, Al Green, Al Green, great guy, wonderful singer and a good songwriter too. <laughs> I mean, that, because that's, that's a, a story that I will never forget. It's like, oh my God, Al Green's not here. <laughs> oh, you know, his plane was delayed. Da, 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 da. And then he he runs the door, the door, because in Saturday Night Live, you know, they, they have these double doors that you run and you know, that you that you walk into the audience uh, and, and be seated. And he ran down the hallway and up the steps onto the stage and hit the show. <laughs> I have a feeling that he did that before. Yes. Oh, no, that wasn't the first time. <laughs> it was the first time. Yeah, it wasn't the first time because it was like, it, and, it, and it didn't miss a beat. It was just like, hey, I'm here. Well, yeah. yeah. Now the show can start, even though it was live. <laughs> and now the show can start, you know. Wow. Yeah. Making those producers pretty nervous. I'm sure. I'm sure. Nobody you, uh, can stand in for Al. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Uh, yeah, you have to find a cast member that can do a really good Al Green. Well, well <laughs> they weren't there that night. <laughs> They weren't there that night. They weren't there that night. Russ Teitelman was producing um, Eric Clapton. He said, oh, you want to sing on this? And I said, well, who is it? And he said, uh, it's Eric Clapton. And who else was in the room? Milton Nascimento. Now, I have um, an album by, um, oh my God, what is his name? Uh, that Milton was singing on. And as it turned out, we're big soap opera fans. You know, and so we were just talking about the soap operas, Milton Nascimento, one of the finest singers ever. We were talking about soap operas, and then there's Eric Clapton there. And it's like, wow, who would believe? I mean, who would believe that this little girl from Newark, New Jersey, would be sitting in this room with people like that? You know? And they were just the nicest, the nicest people. Russ Titleman, and Eric Clapton, and Milton Nascimento sit, sitting in the room. Oh, oh, Milton did a, uh, an album with uh, um, Wayne Shorter did an album and Milton Nascimento was featured on it. And that's how I knew about Milton Nascimento because I had the Wayne Shorter album. And so I was asking him about the album and then, you know, it turned into the soap operas and it was like, he was so cool. Yeah, very cool. Back, so to your, back to your downbeat, you know, days. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, My downbeat. Yes. And you recorded with R. Kelly? You know what? The, the thing with R. Kelly was a duet with Celine Dion. Now, R. Kelly was not there, but she was there. And it was a big group. I think it was for a Christmas, a Christmas, um, uh, a Christmas song, a holiday song. And uh, he wasn't there, but she was there. She was nice. But it was, a, it was such a big group of people. It was, like, it was like a choir. It was a choir. But, you know, it looks good on the credit, though. <laughs> it's cool. You got some more uh, rock credits here. I got to mention because they're big time. Um, Black Crows. Sting. Oh yeah, yeah. I remember them. I remember Black Crows because we went in and I think we did maybe we did a lot of songs for them um, at the Power Station. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it's funny. It's funny what you remember. It's like why would I remember the studio? <laughs> well, we yeah we did that at the Power Station. Yep, Black Crows. Yep. They just, Black Crows just made a comeback. I think they put a record out last month. They finally got their brothers back together again. That's cool. Yeah. That's cool. Um, Beyonce? Beyonce did, um, <clears throat> she did The Closer I did, Get to You. And she did it with Luther. And we sang the background on that. Luther, Luther's people sang the background. Yeah. So. And we had it all ready because she was coming and then we had to go. <laughs> so... I was like, Beyonce. <laughs> yeah, were you down with the new version? With the who? Were you down with the new With that version? version? Oh, look, I'm, I'm all for anybody making money. <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. I don't know if she, if she did it in her show. 
Um, but, um, you know, it, it sounded decent. I mean, how could you sing a duet with Luther and it not be good? Hmm. You know, that's very true. Yeah. yeah. And you mentioned him earlier, but Lenny Kravitz. Oh my goodness. Yes. The Prince of rock and roll. Yes, yes, yes. Lenny. Very nice. Very nice. I did a few, quite a few tours with him and, um, he, Lenny is a, also a musicologist, you know, he, he knew about my history and that's why he wanted me to work with him, you know? And so, um, I did a, I did a couple of tours with Lenny. It was real. it was, I mean, tra I mean, I've been on so many airplanes until it's ridiculous, but, um, Lenny was a lot of fun, but what I liked about Lenny, he was a lot of fun, but when it came time to work, we got to do that sound check. We got to do these rehearsals, uh, rehearsal, sound check, rehearsal, 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 rehearsal. I love that. I love that. So he wanted to make sure that the music was correct. And I remember once um, we were out, I was out with Lenny and um, he had an opening act um, who did not want to rehearse. And so Lenny said, oh, no, I can't. I can't, um, I can't have him on my show if he doesn't want to rehearse. And it was like a big time producer, someone who made everybody very happy. So oh, I'm happy. And Lenny said, no, can't, he can't be on the show because he didn't want to rehearse. Hmm. <laughs> but Lenny, that's, 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 I loved him. I loved him. Lenny, um, we did um, a couple of albums uh, a couple of tours, and then uh, we did. We went to his place in the Bahamas because uh, uh, he had a studio there, and we recorded with him there in the Bahamas. Really nice, ah, oh, really nice guy. And his daughter Zoe. I mean, she was a little girl then, and now she's this famous actress. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, oh my God, look at little Zoe. <laughs> and Lenny looks just as young as she does. <laughs> you know, so he'll he'll always be like for me. He's the prince of rock and roll. And not Prince, the purple one, but the Prince of Rock and Roll. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and mm -hmm. they were friends too. Um, yeah. Yeah. I remember of... Prince being at a show that we did. And it's like, oh my God. And then, you know, because he's sitting, as we're going out on stage, he's sitting on the side of the stage. And it's like, oh my God, is that Prince? <laughs> oh my God, this is going to be great. So, uh, you know, oh yeah. Lenny, nice guy. Good experience. Yeah. Sounds like it. Oh yeah. Yeah, I'm thinking about that uh, rehearsal thing, though, that maybe that's a little bit of a generational thing. I think it is, you know, because uh, Lenny is a, a old school th that way. You know, we've got to rehearse because the, mu the music has got to be right. And nobody has a problem with rehearsing. So and if you do, it's like, well, well why are you here? <laughs> you know, because that's the whole purpose of the performing for the people is to have the rehearsal, at least the foundation of the song, you know, so. That was a while back, though. So well, who knows? Everybody could have changed by now. Who are uh, one or two of the biggest characters that you ever worked with in your incredible history? Let's see. Cat in M. Tume. He was, oh my goodness, he was something. He was, you know. People think he was very serious, but he was, uh, he, the man was hilarious. He was very funny and extremely witty. We both liked Oscar Wilde. So, uh, you know, it's, um, he was very witty. And who else? Um, you know, uh, mm, I don't know. Because nobody was, uh, I'm trying to think of somebody that was maybe extremely funny or something like that, but I can't think of anybody right up here. But the, the coolest guy, the coolest guy was David Bowie. Just, just the epitome of cool. But he knew that music inside and out. He, he understood what, what it was supposed to be and he could explain it to you and, and still make you feel free enough to, to add to it. So, I mean, I really enjoyed him. I did um, an obscure Bowie record, uh, Black Tie, White Noise with Al B. Shore. And, but we did a promotional tour and um, he was so gracious and just such a, oh, it was, he was all, as they say, all of that in a bag of chips. He was all mm. of that. Yeah, it was all of that. Yeah. Who, who is the top perfectionist? Um, actually, actually it was Luther, but 
we were having so much fun. Uh, it's like, you know, it was, um, it was more laughing than singing, but we got, he knew exactly what he wanted. And he knew what each person could give, you know, vocally. And so he, he had the right people. He had the, the, a great group of people and he just finessed everything that he, he wanted. And he got the sound that he wanted all the time. He had his core singers and then he had, you know, if he, if it was a larger group. So, um, and Luther was, that's something that I could count on every year because, you know, with, um, with AFTRA, you know, you have to earn X amount of dollars in order to be, to, to have insurance coverage, you know, to be, um, you know, to have your insurance. And so Luther, every year in January, he would go into the studio. It's like, oh, well, I know I'm going to be covered now for my, for my AFTRA insurance. Uh, so, you know, not, and not only did we sing well, we were covered. <laughs> we were covered. So, but Luther, Luther was a, a perfectionist, but not in a crazy sort of way. You know, he would just, you know, he would just tell you what he wanted. And all you had to do was sing it back. <laughs> you know, not try, don't try to change anything that he's giving you because it's like, no, this is what I want. And this is how you do it. But other people, they, they, sometimes they would give you liberty to change, but they didn't know what they wanted. So, you know, they would try different things until they got the sound that they wanted. But Luther knew exactly what he wanted every time, every time. Do you think he was the most gifted male vocalist that you worked with? Without a doubt. Hands down. Hands down. Hands down. Yeah, I would. I, I often wonder how he would be uh, treated today. You know, had he still, if, if he was still here, would he still be? I mean, he'll always have his core base, but you know, uh, like with Dave Matthews, um, in 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 nineteen ninety nine, two thousand, I I would see the, the the audience, and then twenty years later, 10, 20 years later, they're there with their children. You know what I'm saying? So it would, I don't know if Luther would have like the generation thing like like Dave Matthews does. Because now now the grandmother and the and mom and the kids are out there watching Dave Matthews. They're all sitting out there enjoying Dave, you know. But I, I don't know if that would be, if it would have been like that for Luther. But Luther was such the, the professional. He had the costuming and the music and the, the choreography, all of that was just, ah, uh, it was amazing. It was amazing. And I was one, I wasn't one of the ones doing the choreography. I was sitting um, in the band. He had, he would have four or five singers sitting in the pit and he would have the band. And then he would have the people on stage, you know, who wore the costumes. But with Luther, um, um, <laughs> this is so funny. When uh, they, they called me to do, um, I, I wanted to audition for Luther. First of all, I didn't have to audition, but he had a manager that said, oh, you have to be a certain height to work with Luther. And then I called Luther and I said, Luther, they said I couldn't audition because I'm too short. <laughs> you know, but he was looking, he had a look that he wanted for stage. So he got singers that were the right height and the right size for stage. But, um, but I always sang in the pit, but I also sang on just about all his albums. So, I mean, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't have to be on the stage you know what I mean I was there in the band in the pit with the band so I think the only song I didn't album I didn't sing on with Luther was the one that, that came out when we were touring with Juicy Fruit so but all the others I, I sang on maybe one one or two albums out of all his albums I didn't sing on mm. interesting to hear he was very dialed into the aesthetic aspect of presentation as well absolutely absolutely and once he had budget Oh my goodness, the ball gowns, you know, with the beads, the beaded ball gowns and the, you know, uh, and the, the choreographer that was with Motown, I can't remember his name right offhand, um, did the choreography for the show. And it was, that's, he had the whole thing in his mind. He knew what he wanted to see. And that's, and he got a chance to do that. Hmm. Yeah. So if we're looking at the uh, Tawatha AG story and, mm -hmm. you know, we want three songs to represent, you know, what you're most proud of or want to be thought of, um, mm -hmm. Juicy Fruit, let's say is one, what yeah. would two other ones be? Um, mm, juicy Fruit, um, well, first and foremost. The others, do they have to be in two May songs? No, in fact, maybe they should be other songs. Oh, well. There is a song that uh, M. Tume and I had planned on doing 
uh, mm, maybe I shouldn't even mention it. Just, just do it. Um, okay, so we have uh, Juicy. We have, um, there's another song that I did when I was 17 at, at Howard and I was singing in the gospel choir. And it's a song called, By the Time I Get to Heaven. Okay. That was like my first, like church recording, big church recording. Um, that one. And also I liked singing, I'd Rather Be With You. The one that we did, not, um, not Bootsy's version. But I had Mudbone singing with me. So it was, it was cool. Cause I had like a little bit of history in there. But um, yep, those three. Those three. He's got a really unique tone. Who, Mudbone? Yeah. Oh, my God. And he sounds exactly the same. I met him when I was with Lenny uh, because Mudbone was living in Paris. And, uh, and, and I was in Paris with Lenny. And then I called Bone and he came out and he came out and, uh, you know, came to the hotel and we went out and just went all over Paris and the, the, the city. And he looks exactly the same and he sounds exactly the same. It's like, boom, there must be a picture of a very old man in your attic because, you know, because you look exactly the same. <laughs> exactly the same. No. It's almost like the Anthony Newley reference. You have the portrait of Dorian Gray reference, which I have to explain to people all the time. It's oh, the Dorian Gray. Oh, uh, yeah. Because, you know, we, you know, we know about Dorian Gray. We know yeah. that. In a, yeah. And we know Anthony Newley. But, yeah. but you know. People don't even talk about him anymore. And we believe in rehearsing, you know? You have to rehearse. <laughs> we have to rehearse. I mean, how could you not? You don't, you don't want to go out there and wing it. <laughs> you might be winging in the wrong direction, you know? <laughs> yeah, that's why I made sure I had your list of credits here for talking. Oh, about. oh, but wait a minute. But did you see the Rolling Stone article? Did you see that? Ah, nice oh, this was the one this is this is my this is the wow and i've done some great interviews with uh quest love a uh, qls uh, and a great interview with tony holly but this one was the most thorough or the rolling stones the rolling stone what's the issue date the issue date is andy green let's see i just i just printed this out when was this this was this year? Let me see. Oh, July 2nd. I mean, July 1st, 2021. All right. Well, that's essential reading. That, I mean, it, it's, it's very, it's long, but it's, they list everybody. I mean, they didn't leave, he didn't, Andy Green didn't leave anyone out, including um, videos of the, the people that I worked with. So, uh, or the songs that I mentioned, he, it was like, oh my goodness, it was, it was amazing. But that was the, that's the one. And this Beautiful. is, and Tume was so proud when he saw this. I said, look, man, I made the Rolling Stone. <laughs> yeah, that's that the way great. to get uh, a nice break from the pandemic. Oh yeah. Oh <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Yep. Yep. Um, before I let you go to Wath, I want to ask you, um, if you could have only five albums to hear, on a desert island, uh -huh. not not your own. Okay. Who would they be? What would they be? It would be the first one would be Kirk Franklin's Christmas album. <laughs> oh, Kirk Franklin's Christmas album. The second one would be um the song, maybe not the album, of Rita's gospel thing. Um, um um, she did a song called Holy Holy, which was a Marvin Gaye song. She did that on her gospel album. That I would also have to have um, a song by this artist by the name of Marvin Sapp. And he sings a song called Never Would Have Made It. That's three. Um, the fourth would be um, Roger, Trot Roger Trotman, More Bounce to the Ounce. <laughs> and... The fifth would be, there's a song, The Time did an album, did a, uh, album, did a CD that had a DVD with it a few years back. And it was, uh, oh my God, there's a song Con that- I played. Condensate is, yeah, is that album. Condensate, yes, Condensate, that album. That album. Original seven, yeah. 
the original seven, yes. And the vi the DVD that came with it was amazing because, I mean, you got a chance to hear everybody talk uh, and everybody just say what, what was really going on when they were coming up. So um, I really love that kind of thing, yeah. Did you ever get to meet Roger Troutman? No, no. And he was on the verge of doing, um, you know, he was already great, but he was on the, the verge of just some next level stuff before he passed away. But it was just, he was amazing because when I heard, I, I have the, the 12 inch <laughs> of more bounce to the ounce, you know, the, the big, the album. So, I mean, the vinyl. And um, I love that song, more bounce to the ounce. Oh, and one more song. I'm sorry. Hot Legs, Rod Stewart. <laughs> That I liked. So there you go. I got you got Kirk Franklin and some other gospel people. Oh, and of course, anything by the Clark sisters. But you know, that I'm gonna have 10, 10 in that group of five in a minute if I keep talking. And you never worked with Rod Stewart? No. That would seem like you'd be great at backgrounds on his. Yeah, I would love to do that. And you know what? I've always wanted to work with um Bonnie Raitt, but she doesn't use females. So it's like that's cool, Bonnie. It's cool. But I, I, I can wish. <laughs> I could wish. I, I love Bonnie. I would have thought that Zap or Roger would have been on one of those funk fests with them to me at some point. But you know, um, the, the, not not with them to me, but when I, I did something, it was like a funk fest, um, you know, with 20 acts on the bill and, and Zap was there. Um, but it was so many people on the bill until I couldn't even see them. You know what I mean? It was like everybody gets like 10 minutes, you know. So, uh, and that was like Zap, um, Delphonics, the, the uh, Sky, um, sometimes Evelyn, Champagne King, Nisi Williams, you know, one of those uh, things. Um, and so, and I was, I was happy to have that experience of doing those kind of shows because I'd never done that before. So um, it, that was fun. But um, but Zap was on there. I remember seeing them on the on the card. Yeah. Yeah. I, and I don't know how it would times. be without. You know, it's I, it's like seeing the Temptations. I mean, I saw the original, the original, original Temptations, like when I was like 13 years old, David Ruffin and, and, um, and um, I mean, the originals. <laughs> and then now here we are in 20, just say 2020. And then there's another set of Temptations and there's only one original guy left. So, but, but the Temptations was the only group where wherever they, whenever they got a replacement singer, he was amazing, you mm -hmm. know, uh, because uh, Ollie Woodson uh, used to come out and sing with Aretha. And it's like, oh my God, Ollie Woodson from the Temptations. It's like, he was, he's, he was such a great singer. And I think that was the last one. They always had great, the, whoever replaced whoever left was really good. So, you know, they had a real gift for that. But, that's my temptation story. <laughs> <laughs> well, I saw I got... the original ones, the original temptations. Oh my gosh. So I saw the original zap with Roger. So wow. I mean, yeah. mm, more bounce to the ounce. Now yeah. it's a Bootsy production. So you go back to the Bootsy thing that we we're talking about. You know? yeah. 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 I mean, it's a small world. The funk, the RB, the you know, it 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 intersects. It, it they merge. They always merge, you know. With a lot of uh, church and gospel influence in your top five, for sure. Oh, you uh, yes. Yeah. And you know what? And the, the only thing that's different are the lyrics. Because <laughs> the tracks are slamming. All the tracks are slamming. But, um, but I, I love gospel music is my first love. Hmm. My first love. Yeah. So what's on your radar for the rest of this year? Musically. This year? Uh, well, you know, I did, you know, that the Aretha movie, the uh, Jennifer Hudson, that Jennifer Hudson was in? I did that. I did that soundtrack. Um, but that was when we were in COVID. And so I just, I, we, I did my part at, at my house. So, um, because we couldn't, we couldn't go into the studio. So um, I did that. But that was, I think that was last year. And, um, and now I'm starting to get a few gigs slowly coming out you know because of the COVID thing it's it's, it's you know it's it's hard to 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 maneuver that because um the, the things change every day things change every day so um my live performances are few and far between few and far between and but I just did an uh 
uh, a session, but I sang all the parts myself. So there were there was no other singers there. So um, with this for this guy named Aurelio Voltaire. It's like wow, and he was it was like David Bowie tribute. So uh, that was cool. But um, the work work has been slow. But I'm but it's not that it's been slow. It's just I haven't accepted the gigs because it's like um, I don't think it's quite time. But soon, you know, can't can't stay in the house forever. Mm -hmm. Can't stay in the house forever. Just be masked up and backed up and do what you have to do. You know. Well, it's so heartening to see folks getting back out there again, you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Because it's like, oh, no, I could do that. I could do that. Yeah. Because my friends are out are working. Um, uh, and it's like, wow. And, you know, they get sick. They stay home. And then they come back out when, they, when it's time to, to work again. So, you know. But I do want to finish the, the, um, the, I, the um, my EP because that's, that's what Intuma and I had discussed. That was, that was the last thing. That was going to be the last thing that he produced. So, um, but like I said, he got too sick and he couldn't, he couldn't do it, but it's going to be done. It's going to be done. So I'm looking forward to doing that. It's just finding the right people now, you know, so, but I'll do it. It'll be fun and it'll be good. Yeah. And I know what the dedication will be. That's for sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's what I'm looking forward to. That's what yeah. I'm looking forward to. Yes. How can people uh, sort of keep, you know, tabs on what you might be up to? And Oh, you know what? Um, um, I, on social media at, at Tawatha AG on Instagram, on Facebook. So, uh, and my website, uh, www.tawathaag.com. You know, it's a beautiful website and you get a lot more information on there there's an epk in there uh, along with all the things that we discussed today and more <laughs> and more fantastic man yeah, it's been no. such a blast talking to you even better than i expected you're a delight oh, i'm so glad even if i have my dings i i, I have to learn how to turn those uh, notifications off <laughs> uh, you know but we'll um we'll figure that out for next time after your, absolutely. your ep comes out and we'll maybe talk again and Oh, that would be wonderful. That would be wonderful. I really enjoyed speaking with you. It's great. Likewise. Thank you so much for all the great music too. Oh, my pleasure. And there's more. The best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Truth and Rhythm. A big thank you goes out to our guest as well as to you, the viewer and listener. Also much gratitude to Pleasure for supplying the show's funky opening and closing music. As a reminder, you can always access the complete list of linked shows by episode at funkinstuff.net. I urge you to support this program and receive the extra benefits along with that by subscribing to the Funk and Stuff channel on YouTube and sharing it with funk, R&B, and jazz lovers, joining Truth and Rhythm's membership program at Patreon, submitting a donation at funkinstuff.net, buying Everything is on the One, the first guide to funk book at Amazon, Shopping at the Funky Things store for cool merchandise at funkinstuff.net and linking through funkinstuff.net for all of your Amazon purchases. In addition, if you're an artist or anyone seeking proven results oriented professional marketing, PR, writing, or editing consultation or production, check out the media services section at funkinstuff.net. Also, I encourage you to drop me a line at scottg at funkinstuff.net. I love the feedback, suggestions, guest requests, appearance and sponsorship inquiries, and just talking about my favorite subject, groove-based music. For now, and as always, this is Scott Dr. GX Goldfine saying, keep on keep vibing, on vibing to the rhythm of the one.